Hey, as promised, I'm back today to talk about beauty care and hygiene and reducing your amount of estrogen exposure or xenoestrogen exposure in this area of your life. In my last video, I talked about how to get your air and water clean and some really, really light details about how to clean up your food in terms of estrogen exposure. Today I'm going to be talking about everything beauty care and hygiene, so soaps and laundry detergent as well. And I really just have three ingredients that I want to talk about today that are the most estrogenic in our hygiene and beauty care products. So I'll start out talking about the first one, which is the least known, at least as far as I'm concerned. I didn't know about this one until just a little while ago. It's butylated hydroxy, and there are two different kinds that are used in beauty products in particular. Butylated hydroxy anisole and butylated hydroxy toluene. And these are used most commonly in things like lipstick and moisturizer, things that are a little bit slippery or greasy or waxy, as a preservative. And they are definitely estrogenic in form and nature. So on your labels, you're going to be looking for these two ingredients, and they might be abbreviated. Butylated hydroxy anisole might be abbreviated as BHA, and butylated hydroxy toluene would be BHT. These are things that are likely to be on ingredient lists when you're looking at your makeup and moisturizers, and even sun care, so sunscreen and things like that might have these in them. And as we're talking about looking at ingredients on cosmetics, I just want to mention a resource. This is one of my favorite resources. It's called a Consumer's Dictionary of Cosmetic Ingredients. And it's not 100% up to date on every bit of research, of course, because every time a book like this comes out, it's always a little bit outdated. But if you get the most recent publication of it, it should be pretty good. And I've noticed there are a couple cases where it won't mention estrogenic products in the description, um, but most cases it will. It's very, it's not shy about mentioning that things are estrogenic. So if you are a user of a lot of skincare and makeup products, then this is really an essential tool for you as you're going around the grocery store or the department store, wherever you buy your beauty products. Uh, pretty much guarantee that the beauty products that you're buying will probably have these butylated hydroxies in them unless you're getting them at a health food store or health pharmacy. So unless you're getting something that has just a few ingredients, super simple, mineral-based probably in its pigmentation, you're probably going to want to watch out for these butylated hydroxies. Now the next two ingredients are things you might have heard about, thankfully. We're getting more and more education about things like phthalates and parabens. And there are lots and lots of labels that say pretty large print, no phthalates, no parabens. Um, and that's great because we need to know that when they are being taken out. And one of the reasons that we need to know that is that they are not required in the current FDA labeling laws. There is a bit of a loophole that you may not know about that means that fragrance can mean a broad classification of ingredients. So with the FDA guidelines as they are right now and the laws that regulate labeling, we know that if it says fragrance on a label, any kind of fragrance, whether it's natural fragrance or synthetic fragrance, it can include other ingredients under that kind of heading or label. And so parabens and phthalates are two things that could be included and therefore hidden from you in the label. And so these are really, really important to know about. And I'm going to show you some of the uh, common names or abbreviations for parabens and phthalates because they come in many, many different forms. So we'll start with the phthalates, the common phthalates. Now this isn't even a complete list, but this is the vast number of the different names that phthalates have. And phthalates are plasticizers, and 
plasticizers make things more flexible. So if you think about nail polish, think about it not chipping but staying on kind of like glue would, that's the phthalate in action in the nail polish. However, phthalates have a different role that have nothing to do with plastic. Um, they are in many, many plastics, especially the more flexible kinds. But they take a role in fragrance and the preserving of fragrance as well. And so phthalates will be added to just about anything with fragrance to make the fragrance, number one, last longer as a shelf life kind of continuance. But also to be more pungent sometimes just in your initial impression of the fragrance when it comes out of the bottle or the spray. So when you think about it, pretty much every beauty care product I've ever experienced in my life has a fragrance. You think about, you close your eyes and think about the smell of the powder puff when you first put that makeup on as a teenager. And think about the smell of the lipstick when you're putting it on your lips. There's a sensation that is built in that is meant to be satisfying to the senses. I think about when I was cleaning my face as a teenager, the first scent that I associated with a clean face was the smell of Noxzema. And that's a super strong smell, and I still remember it, and every time I smell that kind of minty, herbal smell, I, it takes me back to those days. So we have a lot of scent associations with makeup and cleansing products, and even laundry detergent for that matter. And fortunately, there are some products that are being scented now with essential oils instead of synthetic fragrance, which is so much better for our system. But it's really, really hard to tell which ones are especially if they use the word fragrance in the ingredient list. So why am I showing you these lists of phthalates then? Well, because there might not be the word fragrance in the ingredient list. So I want you to be able to tell if it doesn't have a fragrance. These are the kinds of phthalates that might be listed if it's being used as a preservative or a plasticizer. And likewise, I have a list for you of parabens. So here's my list of common parabens, much shorter list. But there are more parabens than this list. This is just the common one, especially for beauty products. So if you're looking at your cosmetics and it doesn't say fragrance, but it does say one of these abbreviations, then you'll want to not buy that product anymore if you're trying to take estrogen out of your life. Now, of course, there are some compromises. You may just decide that your favorite lipstick or your favorite foundation that you're super attached to is something that you're not willing to give up and you're willing to eat organic instead and clean up your air and clean up your water and make other sacrifices. And that's totally understandable. I just want you to know, and this is just for educational purposes, where the estrogens are that are kind of lingering in those beauty products. So I just want to talk a little bit more about the nature of parabens. So parabens are a little bit different than phthalates. They're not plasticizers. They are pure uh, fragrance enhancing preservatives. So they are fragrance enhancing once again. And they're also, they have my, antimicrobial qualities. So they might be added to something that might be left out in the air and that might get some microbes in it and start growing either some yeast or some fungus as a result of those microbes. And it's kind of to make it last longer and not get that kind of infiltration from airborne microbes. So antimicrobial, we think about hand sanitizer and soaps and things like that. But antimicrobial agents are added to other beauty and skincare products as well. And so that's why we want to make sure and look at the list to see if there are any parabens aside from the fragrance that might be hiding them or the label, the word fragrance on the label that might be hiding them. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons I've learned in my life as I've tried to weed these products and these ingredients out of my life. So it's been pretty easy for me because I only wear lipstick now and once in a while I'll wear a little bit of con concealer. Um, so I've, been, I've had a pretty easy time in the makeup realm, which honestly it's really the hardest realm that there is in terms of getting some of these products and ingredients out of your life. The current science on parabens says that between 75 and 90% of cosmetics contain parabens. 
So really, cosmetics are the battlefield that we're working with. And so if you can weed out any of your cosmetics, any of your makeup products, you're going to win by increments that way. But there are a many, many other products in our lives that contain scents and parabens. And one example you might not think of is just candles. I used to have a huge collection of candles because I love to burn candles during my baths. And now I only buy these beeswax candles. And I'll put a, a link to my favorite source of beeswax candles in the description below. But we don't associate that kind of fragrance with being estrogenic necessarily, but it definitely is a source of estrogen. Another really tough lesson that I've learned is just weeding through all of the natural laundry detergents. It was pretty easy for me to just switch to vinegar as a Windex replacement or window cleaner or surface cleaner or general um, just cleaning my bathrooms and kitchen surfaces. But when I switched to natural non-paraben and non-phthalate containing laundry detergent, I had to go through quite a few before I found one that really worked to take stains and odors out of my clothes. So we need to get just the right mix of natural ingredients to do really that tough cleaning. And I think laundry detergent is the toughest. So the brand that I recommend and the one that I use now exclusively is Seventh Generation. And it's not too expensive compared to some of the smaller bottles, um, some of the other more fancy kinds of laundry detergent. So this one is kind of a medium range in the budget area. And I really like it, especially the lavender scented. It really does take away the odors and the stains adequately. So I wanted to share that. And I've learned that with my hand soap in my bathrooms and kitchen dispensers, that I like to do those foaming dispensers. And I've learned to use this super simple Dr. Bronner's. This is the citrus scent, but it comes in lots of different colored labels with lavender and mint and tea tree and orange, other different scents that you can get. This is a concentrated soap, and so it is kind of expensive for this large bottle. You only need like a teaspoon per cup of water to, to water it down and wash just about anything. You can wash your hair with this, you can wash your hands, you can wash your car with it safely, your dishes. So we take it camping and it's kind of an all-purpose soap. But with the foaming dispensers, I like to put it in and I just put a teaspoon in and then fill the rest of the foaming dispenser up. And that's a really good economical way to use a soap that you know is scented with only essential oils and there are no fillers and preservatives and parabens and phthalates in it. So one other area that I think of when I think of parabens is hand sanitizer. And this last year I've used more hand sanitizer than I ever have before in my life. And the, for the first few months I was just trusting all hand sanitizer to be safe. I didn't realize that parabens are hidden under that fragrance label or that word fragrance on the label and so I was just willy-nilly taking everyone's hand sanitizer and slathering up with it using it at work using it in stores and I had no kind of barrier or boundary around it until it just occurred to me one day oh my goodness I don't really know what's in this it's just like any other soap or beauty product that I would be normally very very cautious of if it had the word fragrance and so since then, I've only carried my own personal hand sanitizer, and I make my own now just with aloe gel and essential oils. So I just put a little lavender and tea tree and sometimes some orange oil. But tea tree is a really, really good disinfectant. So you can make your own hand sanitizer or you can just buy one. Farmers markets have locally made hand sanitizers these days. You can get them in health food stores, all kinds of different choices. So I like to get the most locally made ones because they tend to be the freshest and they use the least, pres least preservatives. So finally, I just want to talk about some of the other resources that I'm going to point you to down in the description because there is so much more to say on this topic and of course I can make an hour-long video easily on this topic. 
but I want to point you to some of my other videos that talk about my own story and how I've really gotten my skin and hair care routines cleaned up. And the way that I do that is, if you don't want to watch those videos, the secret is go to the Environmental Working Group's ewg.org website and go to their Skin Deep database, or you could just do a Google search for Skin Deep database. This is an amazing tool, and it's actually an app that you can download on your smartphone. And you can actually look up ingredients and products while you're shopping in the store. So while you're out there in the store discovering beautiful new products that are tantalizing and have wonderful labels and colors, you can look them up and see how they're rated on the Skin Deep database. And my other videos talking about pure skincare and hair care items, I always talk about the fact that the things we put on our scalp and on our skin are exactly like the things that we're drinking and eating. They get into our bloodstream in a very similar way. And there are barriers in place to protect us. That's why we get skin allergies and skin irritations. But the barriers don't protect us from all of the synthetic chemicals that come in our modern day products. And so I just want to point you to that one resource, the Environmental Working Group's Skin Deep database. I will link to that below. And I'll also link here in the cards up above to my skincare, 100% natural skincare video. And just telling my story of how I've really honed my personal skincare routine and regime down to a very few simple ingredients. And then my natural hair care video talks very similarly about how I've learned to use very few products on my hair and my scalp. In the future, I'll probably do a video about my tooth care routine and the product that I make to brush my teeth with. I make that homemade DIY as well. But I do have a video, and I'll link that here up above, that talks about how I make my own homemade deodorant. And deodorant is a real tough one when it comes to things that can cause estrogen dominance, for sure. So link that here so that I don't have to go on and on in this video and point you to those videos that I think will be really helpful. They're very recent videos, so very up to date in their information. So thanks so much for watching this video. The next one is going to be about estrogen and how we metabolize it. It's gonna be much more science rich. I'm gonna show you the estrogen metabolism pathways and we'll talk a little bit about the ways that estrogen can get stuck in our system in the metabolism process through the way that our liver works, but also through the way that our diet and our genetics work. So look for that next video on estrogen metabolism and genetics. And I'll see you there. Take care.